guess we'll officially there we go. I, I guess we'll officially uh, kick off uh, the future mobility panel here uh, as part of the Winter Games. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, die I'm a little flustered. I don't even know how to begin this now. Uh, it's been such great conversation. I feel that I'm still in the future of sport conversation <laughs> that we're having between nine and ten thirty. Even somehow we're rolled in like hospitality and bars as well. But that's what makes for a great conversation is we can pivot in any way we want. Exactly. And so we're we're tremendously excited, especially about this panel. It's so uh, poignant for smart cities, smart regions, smart countries, uh, and the work that I think we're all doing and we're all interested in. Uh, just to kind of level set, um, you know, this will be recorded and shared with over the 1,200 registered attendees that we have uh, as part of these three-day event. It's really, really exciting to see the turnout. And so uh, we will be able to record this and, and then provide it to, to all the attendees that might be in another session and might not be able to join us. Uh, but just, just some other numbers for you. Uh, of those 1,200, we have 80 different, uh, what we're calling coaches, but 80 different presenters, including the amazing panel that we have here today. And from those over 1,200 attendees and 80 different coaches, we're represented on six continents. So it's truly amazing to see the third year of the Smart Region Summit, now the Winter Games really going global and being able to bring in global perspectives uh, around not only future mobility, but also uh, all things smart city and smart region. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'm really excited to, to have this conversation on the future of mobility. Uh, and what we thought is we'd actually just allow uh, each of our panelists to introduce themselves, give a little bit of a background on, on who they are, uh, where, where they're from, because we, we are bringing in a global perspective, as you probably heard today, and, and their thoughts uh, on the future mobility before we dive into the to the deeper conversation. Uh, so, uh, Miguel, uh, the Deloitte Miguel, how about we start with you? Okay, hello, hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here, and thanks for for inviting me. Um, I'm I'm Miguel. I lead globally our Deloitte Smart City and Local Government practice. I would say my role, my, my role globally is, is to be a bit an ecosystem enabler. So to bringing several pieces together and, and making sure they make some sense. I'm, I'm like a, a global convener. And what I try to do is to try to bring the best of knowledge of the firm from each one of the regions and, and bringing to the other region in order to try to scale up solutions and really make, I would say, some urban impacts. I also, I'm also been coordinating uh, the development of some urban solutions that Deloitte is, is invested in. And I, I would say this is a, an area that uh, the future of mobility excites me a lot because I would say we are talking about an ecosystem transformation. It is multi-sectorial, multi, multi multi-domain, and also has impact in three, three relevant dimensions of our life. It has an impact on us as persons so on the social side. It has impacts, impact on our environment because mobility has a huge impact in sustainability and it also has a huge impact in the eco ec economy of our communities because new companies are being, are being, are being uh, built and so on and so on. So I really like this, this work in, on this ecosystem. And it's my pleasure to be here. That's me. Fantastic. Thanks, Miguel. Maybe we'll stay in Lisbon and, and head over to the deputy mayor. So my name is also Miguel, I'm Miguel Gaspar. Um, I'm a civil engineer. I actually went to my, to my course because I, I believed that I was going to build pools as a life because there is a, a, comp a company in the family that built pools. But in the end, in the middle, I found out the transportation and mobility. And I really was in love for what you can do and the, the, the time that you give back, can, you can give back to people if you actually improve the mobility system. So I was a mobility consultant for many years. And these days I'm a politician and uh, I was actually had the privilege to, to be elected as deputy mayor for Lisbon and where I have the, uh, the mobility topic. Also, uh, also today also I'm responsible for the economy, innovation, uh, the startup uh, team and environment that we have here in, here in Lisbon, big data and uh, all that part. So I guess I have a lot of interesting stuff here going on in Lisbon. Uh, and, as, and as a city, and I would like to share that experience with you, we, have, we are driven by the ambition to be one of the best in the world, knowing that today we are not. So we know that there is, it's time to act, and there is a reason for that. And hopefully I will have the time to explain a bit more about that, but that's me. Definitely. Thank you so much for joining us, Deputy Mayor. I really appreciate uh, you staying awake and, and joining this panel. And then now over to Alex, or should I say he asked us to call him the State Farm Miguel. 
for this panel. That's, so, that's uh, right. It would <laughs> it'd be an honor to be called a Miguel with these two uh, additional <laughs> panelists that are there. Um, so I'm Alex Cardona. I work for State Farm, actually here in Tempe, Arizona, so U.S.-based. Um, our offices are actually just a stone's throw away from ASU campus. Uh, we can see into the games the, from the stadium, actually. Um, but I've spent actually the past uh, six years working in the innovation space within our Red Labs um, and innovation work, uh, which has been primarily focused on internal disruption. Um, and when you think of an insurance company, since we're the largest auto insurer and homeowner insurer in the U.S., um, although we're not an international company, um, domestically, uh, internationally, we're always looking at different uh, technology trends and disruption that's happening externally and internally. Um, and so that's what's uh, of interest to us in today's panel is trying to look at what's happening go globally so that we can also bring that back here domestically. Um, a little bit on, on Red Labs, our focus, as I mentioned, is internal disruption. Um, and, and any of those innovation buzzwords you'd like to kind of throw out there. Um, but a lot of our work is on specific concept domains. And so we have teams working ranging from artificial intelligence all the way to blockchain to drones. And a lot of the work that I've been doing has been focused on transportation um, through the transportation engagement office. My, my specific role here in Arizona and the Southwest is more on the B2B and the business development side of things and specifically been working on with the Institute of Automated Mobility and our leadership membership there too. Um, and a lot of that work has then additionally been focused on automated vehicles um, and then also uh, connected mobility and transportation through that. Um, for us, uh, a lot of this is an outgrowth of auto safety. You know, we want people to be safe. Uh, that helps us on the claims and crash side. Um, but a lot of our work isn't specific to insurance either. Um, so some of our products that we're working on might start in the insurance space, uh, but aren't uh, beholden to just having to look at how do we transactionally look at financial services. It could grow from something bigger than that. So thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great. Uh, you know, you mentioned something interesting. You, you spoke about trends um, in your introduction. And, and so I, I think that's a perfect segue to kind of open this question up to, to all three of the panelists. It's you know, what was the future mobility trends at the beginning of 2020? You know, globally, what, what was happening? And then kind of talk to when, you, when you're responding to that question, what was the impact of COVID on those trends? What were the things that were accelerated? Maybe what were the things that were slowed down? And maybe what were the things that were completely changed? So Deputy Mayor, how about I, I shoot it over to you first? Well, I think there, is, there was a, a big change for us here with the Paris Agreement. Uh, I think it's actually very important to go back to that topic uh, because basically the Paris Agreement, you can, you can say it in a very simple way. It was, it's, it's simply, simply put, it's a promise that we did to our sons and to our grandsons that by 2030, we'll deliver them a better city, a better, better country. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the most important thing about this Paris Agreement is that we put together governments and that was it was what uh, it was usual for governments to speak about uh, the sustainability but also cities and companies so i guess putting together these three actors it's it's key for the success and when you look what you, what have to be done you need the economic sec the economic sector to, to act you need cities to change and you need global policies bring brought from the government so i think one of the most important things that we had before the covid was actually this commitment that we have that we that came from the Paris Agreement, and uh, and to be honest, that commitment I, I strongly believe that commitment is resilient, meaning that even if some countries were saying if getting out of the agreement, cities didn't. So globally, it's a strong agreement where society is still strongly committed to. And then when when you start digging what that means, basically when you want to achieve the targets that you want to achieve till 2030. You, you get to a very quick conclusion that it's really time to act. Because when you put in the city perspective, if you want to build a new tram line, or if you want to build a new subway, or if you want to change something, 10 years, it goes by very fast. It's, I usually say that 10 years, it's one day in the life of the city. So, but it's also for, for the companies, the same thing. If you, see, if you start uh, an OEM, a car, a car manufacturer, where is this thinking about a new car, the pipeline between the first idea to the car to being sold to the public 
it's not <laughs> that less than 10 years that they, 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 they take, it's, it takes a lot of time. So basically, I think that there was this, there is this message that we had very strongly that basically we had one shot of everything to actually to achieve what we needed to achieve by 2030. The uh, biggest change that I, I think that it's, it's changing changing more, I think there was there was a drive uh, for the new stuff. So I think everyone was very amused for the new stuff. When I say the new stuff, I would say the right hailing. So the Uber guys, Lyft, those kind of products. There was a there was a big passion about mobility as a service, and we would we all uh, leave our cars, but the, which is a capital cost for families, and go for the operational costs costs of mobility as mobility as a service. And we 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 were believing that in two year time or three year time that will that will be a reality. Where I think that's 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 what changed most because basically when you look when you start looking for instance the capital streams that were going to that companies, part of it were was coming from the car industry. And for instance, OEMs were very present in this kind of business, in this kind of, of business model. And they were pushing big, big money on that, on that business. And when you start pushing the rules, I'm not sure about the US reality, but in Europe, you start pushing the rules for the electric cars uh, and saying that they are to decarbonize their fleet. They, had, they, they stopped that, that stream of investment for the new stuff. And they went for the traditional, which is the car but in a, in, a, in a more electrified way. So they try to reduce the impact of the car. So for me, I think you, you could really feel a step back from the private sector for the, this new stuff. So, so I think that the, the hype about the, around this new stuff went down a bit. And that's not too bad because you know what? For cities to work, the classics need to work also. And when I say classics, I'm saying public transport, mass transit. We really need to, to make it work. Uh, and I think that we, that's also that I think it's, 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 it started to change in 2020 before COVID, which was a, a belief that yes, we, we need the, the new stuff because we need the flexibility of these new transport modes and the flex, flexibility to use the smartphone to move from A to B calling some kind of service. But we also need the trains to work well, the buses to work well. And so we, we cannot forget the investment in public transport. And I, I think, 2019, 2020, we start seeing globally this kind of perspective. And, and, and so I think that do, that will be the major points I will bring from 2020. Thank you. I would like to hand across to our other Miguel now. And as a global leader and with Deloitte positioned as a global leader, what trends are you seeing, um, especially looking forward in 2021? Yeah. Um... You want me to comment on, on the, the future trends or, or on the impact of COVID? For me, it's indifferent. Well, what do you prefer? I, you, can I'm starting... as, you can take it as a part A and a part B question and answer both if you'd like. Okay, good. So let's see what were happening on regarding mobility until uh, pre-COVID. -pre and that's something that for sure we'll, we'll, we'll keep it part after COVID. But let's see. One thing, of course, was electrification. Uh, so based on uh, some numbers, by 2035, 80% of new vehicles would be electric if we go to China. If we go to the rest of the world, it's from 35 to, to, to 50% of new vehicles by 2035 to, to, to will be electric. So that, that was one trend that was, was moving. A second trend, of course, is uh, everything around connectivity and automation. So a drive by by, by the, tech, the tech giants or by the OEMs or by the, the, the transportation the transportation companies or but also many startups were driving this change until then and the third thing was sharing based also on some numbers by 2025 10 percent of all rides would be shared and by 2040 like 80 percent of all rides would be shared so three things were happening electrification automation connectivity and sharing with covid i would say there were three main three main changes, some of them temporary, some of them we don't know, and, and, and some of them we know already that are definitive. I would say the temporary thing was, was a big decrease on share mobility. In Europe, based on some numbers, around 70% decrease on, on, on share mobility. And there was also one thing that changed. In the past, we thought between cost and comfort. 
Now we put cost, comfort, and also also, also safety. So we put the, the security and safety part on our mobility equation. And that that what, what, what made what that made was a return to the private car, and of course a big a big crisis on public transport. So so that's something that I really think are temporary. There was there is one thing which is unknown, which 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 regards homeschooling. In all the discussions I have or that we have about, around the future of education, no one knows if the the e-learning tools, if the, 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 the having lessons from home in universities or in schools, if they, they are here to last or not. If they are here to last, what will happen is the traffic patterns during the day will change. So this may or not be an impact depending, and because the children is one of the drivers of the congestion and mobility because fathers need to take their, their, their children home. And then I would say that the, the things that came to stay with COVID, one thing is of course, home working. And home working, of course, changes the, the, the number of people on the street driving or just moving. Uh, the, the second thing is that there was a big rethinking of public spaces, and, and namely the increase of, of, of the bike lanes. Also, some numbers I got, there was one billion investment in, in, uh, in bike lanes. Uh, lately, during, during COVID, there were built 1,400 miles of, of bike lanes in cities in cities around the world, and the other thing that cities took advantage was a bit to re, to 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 re, redesign their cities. If you remember the number of discussions that we now now have about uh, as a green 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 planning of urban urban, spa urban spaces about uh, the 15 minute city around, and, and everything of this was brought by COVID. So I would say urban planning came uh, in, in a different mindset and I, I, I would say it came, it came to change. So I really think that's the impact that COVID had. You want me to go on for future trends or, 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 or we, we should move on to another panelist? It's up to you, okay. Diana. You are, the, you, are, you are the leader. We'll come back to future trends. Let's okay, good. give it to Alex for a moment. What did you, in terms of your role at State Farm, see in terms of the impact of COVID here locally? Yeah, well, you know, we see this across the country. Um, a lot of companies like State Farm, but insurance overall is, is focused on data. And the data that we continue to see, Miguel's point, is the impacts of um, work from home uh, on dri uh, miles driven. And so you see people not driving. And so there is an expectation also in regards to if I'm not driving, um, what's my exposure um, from an insurance side of things? Um, but then it's also a, a piece of people have vehicles sitting in their homes uh, in their garages or somewhere else. What are they going to do with those vehicles too? And so you do see a shift of people saying, well, I don't need this vehicle anymore. Should I unload this vehicle or get a different type of vehicle um, through that? Um, and I think when you start looking at some of the data of how people are driving, it's not only a shift in how and when people are driving, um, but then it's also... Um, how are they moving if they don't own a vehicle? So if you look at urban spaces, uh, to Miguel's other point in regards to urban planning and urban growth, um, there has been uh, some shifts of people saying, well, maybe it's too expensive to live in a, a city like San Francisco, and it might be easier for me to go uh, move somewhere else and um, work remotely. And one, I eliminate that commute, whether it was in a vehicle or, or uh, via public transportation. I, th I think the other piece that when we're thinking about um, this shift because of uh, not only the pandemic, but where we're going is, um, you know, I think we've all seen those visuals of how many people or how much of the road space is taking up if uh, 50 people are on a bus versus in their individual vehicles. There is a, uh, a startling shift from public transportation to individual vehicles because of health concerns. And so I think there is a, a need by municipal government uh, to consider the impacts on traffic congestion from there too. Yeah, those are, those are great points. And I think this conversation has been fascinating so far to really, you know, talk about what we've seen over the past year and these trends that are really starting to emerge. And so I was just glancing through the, you know, the, the attendee list here, and we have a lot of uh, city leaders, we have a lot of transportation leaders. And so let's, let's pivot now to Miguel's point to kind of the future. Um, and so, you know, and, and 
providing advice to city leaders, you know, that are attending this and that will watch this later. So Deputy Mayor, to, to kind of throw it back to you, what do you really foresee as the future of mobility in Lisbon? And then if you can speak to across the EU more generally, that'd be fantastic. And, and please talk to any specific challenges that you're facing today in that. I think one of the thing, the most important things that didn't change, again, the sustainability agenda was already on, on the topic, of, on our topic, because again, the Paris Agreement really was a commitment between all, all, all of the cities. I, I guess, to be honest, what COVID made was to make all the ag arguments stronger. So we have to accelerate our commitment due to the COVID. It shows us that we are fragile uh, regarding the, the, the issues like air pollution and uh, uh, climate change and all that. So we have to accelerate the effort of cities in becoming more resilient and to adapt to climate change. And I think that's one of the message from of COVID. And, and I think people are also changing their behavior. For instance, going for the Miguel point, just to have an idea, here in Lisbon, we had a 60% 60, 60 drop on demand on public transport. We had around 25% demand drop on cars. So people are moving less because they are staying at home. But we have a 25% increase on bicycles. So when all the other modes were going back, going back down, people were looking for ways to run more, walk more, and, and, and cycle more. So and, and, a, and a very important message, I guess, it's... You know what? We did very bold things here in Lisbon, taking space for the car and putting space for pedestrians because firstly, we are all pedestrians and then also for bicycles. And, and even those cases where people were afraid, well, is that, isn't that too much? Well, after the work was done, it was always full of people. So if you change your cities to give more space to people, to people to walk, to cycle, you will get uh, people using the infrastructure. So between the, the chair first. And I think that's, that's a very strong message that we have with, with the challenge in the next future. If you believe in the concepts of the 15 minute scene, city, the city where you can walk and you can cycle to stuff, then of course, I'm, I sp I'm speaking about cities, not high density areas, of course. So you, you need that density where you can walk to the shop, you can walk to school and you can actually uh, uh, live, live your life in a, in, a, in a near loop. Then I think there is, a, there is something that you have to be very, very careful. With. And I think in Portugal, we have a sex, sex story to, to, tell, to tell about that. In the future, we are going to need the, need the mass transit. I always say this, don't forget that one train transports 1,000 people. It's the most efficient way to move people around in, an, in a metropolitan area. 1,000 people in a train, it's 800 cars or it's 1,000 bicycles. So we, you cannot change trains for other things. And public transport right now is in a crisis. So in, in Portugal and in, other, in some other uh, European cities, we have just enlarged by a lot the public funding of public transport systems, of mass transit. Mass transit cannot fail, cannot go bankrupt. Because if it goes bankrupt, the effort that we have to recover takes too long. In the previous crisis that we had here, the, the previous economic crisis in 2008, the strategy was to cut the, the system. You know what? No money, no funny, no fun. So let's cut the system. We, we are recovering finally today to the levels that we had before the last crisis in what regards the network. So more than 10 years to recover. So if today we will, leave, we, we, we will let the system to go down, it will take at least a decade to recover the impact that we have in this pandemic. So another, in the short term, don't let the systems fail. Don't let the systems go bankrupt. I think that's a very important message. Mm -hmm. Now, moving more to the future, I think the, the a key point, it's focus on the next generation. And, I, and I'm speaking about kids, but also about the ones that are today are 20 or 30 years. There's, there is a generation gap. If you ask people, and we did ask people, what, what do they want? People with more than 55 years want the classics to work well. They want parking available, they want the public transport to work well, and, and, they, have, and they have a huge rejection to things like Uber, ride hailing, e-scooters, they don't, they, they, they hate e-scooters, don't put e-scooters in, in front of them, but, but they, they, there is a huge rejection rate. But if you ask to the generation of the 20 years old or the 40 years old, there is a huge acceptance. So there is a kind of a, a split in the population, and that's normal, it's a generation gap. But the next generation, it's looking for this new stuff. 
I, I, I said that the next transport mode is a smartphone because a smartphone is going to take you from A to B. And then they, you know what? They don't care too much about the car because they can ask the car, they can borrow a car for their parents anyway, because the parents were the generation that wanted to have a car. So they are not fighting that, that much. But let me move a step further. And that's another important message, which is kids. For, for instance, here in Lisbon, we have around 15% of our population and population is getting older, by the way. But anyway, we have 15% population, it's less than 15 years old. But, and those little kids that, they, they are the ones where they, they go to school. Some, some of them have the school near their home, others don't. So some, too many of them are dependent of, by the, of the car to move. And when you think if those 15% of the population, they, 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 they have impact on 30% of the population, which is mom and dad that say that need to take the car to school to take the kids. And then maybe about 10 or 15% of the population, which is the grandfathers, that say that they use the car because on Tuesdays they take the kid to the, to the, to the, to the soccer training. So if you focus on the mobility of kids and you give more autonomy to kids and, you give, and if you build secure paths so they, so they can walk to school, they can cycle to school, they can use the bus in a more autonomous way. If you give autonomy to kids, two things will happen. You will change them culturally because they will, they will know to use the city in a different way and you will reduce the impact of all the other adults around them to reduce the impacts that they have. And to show you that this is a true story, I, I, I got myself a cargo bike on a project of the city project on February. I, I got the cargo bike. For those that don't know what is a cargo bike, it's a big bike where you can put two kids in the back. And I had the bike since February. And here at home, the bike always wins to the car. So if you ask the kids where, well, how, how do they want to go, the first the bike, then the bus, then the car. So, and to be honest, I've read, I've ride myself more than 2000 kilometers on the bike because of the kids, because they want to ride the bike to school every day. And it's my role to take the kids to school. So I'm just giving a personal example, maybe I shouldn't, but the truth is that kids change Kids change the behavior of adults, and they are going to be the adults in 2030. So if you want to focus on policy, it's something that will really have impact on the future, be, be aware of the mobility of kids, because they will really change the, 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 the patterns of the society. I, I think that's phenomenal. Uh, and I'm so happy that we're recording this to, to share with uh, a wider audience, because I, I think that rings true. Uh, I, don't, I have never heard it talked about in such a way. Um, but I think that's going to be very insightful for a lot of these city planners, city leaders here in America um, to hear that story. That, that was pretty inspirational. So, Miguel, you just heard the deputy mayor talk about some of the kind of future trends and, and future policy trends, I, I would say, uh, in mobility. Now let's come back to you to talk about kind of what you're seeing globally as well. Yeah, I would say there are, from 2021 and beyond, I would say there are three components. There are some continuity in some things, some recovery and others and some transformation. So let's start, I'm the consultant, so I always need to structure it like that. <laughs> let's go for the first one. I would say on, continuity, on the continuity, I would say the, sustainabil the sustainability path on mobility, as Miguel said. So that path will continue and it will come from, from the past and from, from, from what's, what, what was going on also around cycling and walking and so on and so on, so fully aligned. The recovery, we will have a slow recovery on public transport and, and, uh, and, and, and everything around sharing. So that, that will be a recovery, it will be a slow recovery. Miguel may have concrete data from the city on the recovery. Uh, it will be slow, we don't know exactly. I, I, based on conversations with you, Miguel, you, you estimate that by the end of the year, I think uh, you will have, you will, you will, maybe you, you will have recovered but uh, it, uh, it may depend a bit on, on a case by case. I would say- We expect on, full recovery by 2023, so of the two years. Yeah, now. yeah, so no, yes. So, so not, not that fast. And, and, and I would say on the transformational side, some things are happening, and of course they will accelerate on the years to come after COVID. One of them is everything around the mobility as a service. Of course, making sure that, uh, Assuming, of course, that we take care of all the data governance issues and everything, ecosystem governance issues of the mobility as a service. So that's something that is really kind of accelerating. Everybody's struggling a bit about the, the governance model and the business model of that. But there are many people discussing that. So it's, it, will, it, will, it will occur sooner than, than later. The second thing is intelligent mobility. 
And intelligent mobility is exactly what Miguel was, was talking about, is mobility target to each segment. One of the segments is, 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 is yes, kids. And I, I think the statistic is also from Lisbon. If the, the, the families without kids, 61% have cars. The family with, with, with kids, then 90% have cars. Meaning that for you to take the cars out, out of the street, you need to take care of mobility for the kids. Because if, if you solve the problem, if everybody is like Miguel and you buy, you, you, you build your cargo by, like you will take a lot of cars off the street and, and streets and, and, and cities will be more, more sustainable. The other segment is the elder. Of course, the commuters has also, is, is also a segment that you need to take care of. The other one is the elder people. The number of people with plus then, let's, let's assume, I don't know exact numbers, but like 70 or 80 will double in the years to come. So it's important that cities and urban planners and mobility leaders, that, that they think about these elder people. And, and that's, that's another component of the intelligent mobility. Another very relevant component is corporate mobility. I would see that, that like corporations like Deloitte of this world and other private companies and even uh, public bodies, of course, uh, uh, they, 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 there is a shift that is starting in, su in supporting the mobility of, of the future, Mo moving from personal car to mobility ceilings, mobility packages, other tools. That is something that is also, there is a trend moving on, on that side. In the future, we may not get a car from the, our company. We may get a mobility package or something, or we may have a, a, a fleet of shared cars from the company or, a, or shared bikes or shared scooters or whatever. Uh, an, another, 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 another relevant trend is the, the fourth transformational one is the mobility of goods, the, urban, the, the relevance of the urban logistics. We will start to have small logistic, lo, logistical hubs in, uh, in, in cities, uh, we may have green ve vehicles for, for last mile, taking out of, the, out of the city, I would say the big logistical infrastructures, let's go, or, or vehicles, vehicles and, and making a, a smaller, smaller logistical hubs to sh to shared by several restaurants or, or, or several commercial, commercial infrastructures, let's call it like that. And, and at the end, of course, uh, we will have, I would say the citizen in the future more and more in the heart of all the solutions. I would say that's, that's what we are foreseeing globally, of course, depending a bit from, from, from country to country. The more developed ones will be faster because it's very dependent on technology. The less developed ones will take, will take a bit longer as, as it needs relevant investments. I don't think I'm the only one who is sitting here extremely excited about what this future holds for us in terms of mobility. I also have to say, as I was listening to the two of you, I had flashbacks of my year living in Belgium, um, where I only rode a bike for a year. And I do believe Belgium and the Netherlands are the only two countries in the world where you learn how to ride a bike holding an umbrella and do so over cobblestones. It's quite a you know, art form that everybody should need to learn at some point in time in their life. But everything you're saying to me suggests that we need partnerships and the partnerships are going to be really key to the delivery and that's private sector, that's public sector, that's the universities. And so I want to pivot somewhat over to Alex. State Farm has been an amazing collaborator and partner across the United States. And I'd like for you to talk about some of the partnerships you're involved in and why State Farm is engaged in these type of partnerships. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, the discussion is super interesting. Um, especially not just from a global perspective, but what it means to people's lives every day. And, you know, from, from our standpoint, uh, for State Farm, we have, you know, somewhere around 19,000 agents in all kinds of cities and municipalities and areas throughout the country. And so when you think of the local impact that we're trying to have, um, I, I continue to think of that what is happening of trends in mobility for rural areas are different than suburban areas than for urban, right? So to your point, Diana, there might be shifts in urban areas to, um, uh, to look at um, bicycling in um, more urban or suburban areas, but that might not work specifically in more rural areas too. And so those are things that we're always trying to figure out. And those partnerships are specific to uh, trying to incorporate those different uh, standpoints in those different ecosystems, to be honest with you. Um, I, I guess I'll give one specific example. So here in Arizona, uh, we're a leadership member with the Institute of Automated Mobility, um, which is uh, sponsored and held by uh, Arizona Commerce Authority. 
Um, and, and that's such an interesting public-private partnership. Um, and I know, as Dom has said before, that you know a lot of the work that we're trying to do is move from think tank to do tank. Um, so, uh, and I have to give all credit to Dom on that. Um, but a lot of these partnerships are knowing that we can't do this all on our own and we can't solve all of this on our own. Similar to a lot of probably the municipalities and public sector individuals that are on this call trying to figure this out is you probably have a lot of startups and large cap companies that come to you saying, we, we have this service and we have this technology, we think it could solve these issues. Uh, I think it's very hard at times for municipalities to do this one off and it's sometimes helpful to have um, similar to the connective that I know Dom and Di and others work on, um, to be able to have a regional perspective to say, well, this city or this municipality or this town worked with this vendor or this technology, how did that go? And will that work for us in this situation? And that's where really our partnerships with like the IAM and working with the Arizona Department of Transportation and Intel and Exponent and the three universities here in Arizona are very, influential for that because we not only get to test this out in urban core areas for like Phoenix, but we could take these to Tucson and to Flagstaff and more rural areas um, and, and really try to say, well, it might work in this scenario, but it might not work in that one. And so while we're testing this re applied research, we can really figure out um, and, 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 and give a good vote of confidence uh, to our public sector partners to say um, this works um, in these situations. Mm. Yeah. I add on something that Alex has just said? Please. Um, yeah, just, just, I think there's some, there is a very important message uh, here, which is when you, when you, we discuss things like the connected car, the uh, vehicle to infrastructure stuff, uh, the connection between operators and all that, the question is connected to who uh, or connected to what? And in the end, you have to be connected to the city. Somehow you have to be connected to the city. And that's a huge change for cities. And that basically cities for decades, for centuries maybe, they were basically managing infrastructures. So we, you know what, the road has to, to, to work, the sidewalk has to walk, has to work, public lightning has to, you want to turn on the lights, you should be a light. But I think we are moving from infrastructure managers to mobility managers. And that's a huge change for cities. Mm. And, and, and basically that means that we need a common language, even, even a, I'm not sure if PPP, it's, a, it's, a, it's the best word. Because it is a PPP, we, we need a new governance model in the mobility for, for, for cities that involve the private side, not necessarily in the business perspective, but in the conversation perspective. So the private side needs to be connected to the public side in managing the future mobility of cities. And there should be a kind of a co-governance where the public, there is a common language between the public and the private side. Just to give you a, a very straightforward example, if the public side can inform in the real-time traffic conditions uh, of a road or, 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 a or a plan closure due to some work in the road, then the guys from logistics can be more efficient in their activities for something as simple as this or, or a simple check-in and check-out of the parking or, or car manufacturers that are informing the city, hey, my radar what my, in the car show that there is a free space and the city gets all the information all together and informs all the cars, here is the free space in the city, let's cruise less for parking, things like that. So, and, and this is a huge challenge that we are going to see in cities because to be honest, cities don't have this capacity today. So in the next 10 years or so, we need to find ways to do two things. First and, for, first and foremost, to, to bring capacitation to, to public workers, to city, to, to public servants, to, to, in a ways, to push them in a way that to do some, some work that they have never done in their life till now. And secondly, we need a common language because just to give you an example, I, we here in Lisbon, we are changing all the traffic lights and we, are, we went for the most open protocol for traffic data. And then we went for an OEM and he said, hey, do you want to, have, to work together with us in Lisbon to do something between cars and traffic lights and let's work together? And the answer is, you know what? we gave up of working with cities because there are too many cities. We just asked the car in front, what is the color of the traffic light? So this means that cities have been too occupied looking for themselves and they are not working in network enough to have a power, to have a voice so that they can be at the global level to be with the industry and create this common language where we can work together. 
And that's for me, for sure, it's a challenge for the next 10 years. And to be honest, you see the networks of cities. I think Lisbon, Lisbon is in the front runner of that group, but cities like LA are definitely doing that. New York definitely doing that. Amsterdam, Amsterdam is doing that. Singapore is doing that. So I think there is the front runners of cities that are working with the industry and especially in, in associations where of cities and industry, the C40 network, for instance, where these kind of topics are really coming to the, to the top. And I think there is a lot of work to be done in the next 10 years on this topic. Oh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I think that's what's so fascinating about the smart city movement. You hit the nail on the head. Cities are going through a massive pivot internally and they just struggle with it, right? You're no longer the streets department, you're the mobility department. You're no longer the lighting department, you're now the connectivity department. It's a massive pivot and cities struggle, uh, are struggling to pivot because you're right, they don't have that internal expertise. So Miguel, I'm gonna toss it over to you because as cities are trying to really adapt and pivot organizationally, culturally, um, you know, they need help, they need guidance. And I, you know, honestly, Deloitte's been kind of uh, a, not only a national leader here, but a global leader in this future of mobility space. You know, we've done a lot of work together uh, helping provide advice to cities. So I would love to turn, turn it over to you and, and really ask you, you know, what is the role of a company like Deloitte in this future of mobility ecosystem? Yeah, let's see what, what we want to achieve. Let's call it level. Let's see our purpose. I, I, I would say the first thing we really want to influence positively, positively, we really want to influence global policy. That's why we have been working with, with uh, uh, specifically with the World Economic Forum, European Commission, World Bank, and so on, global policy for specifically for, for mobility. That's one thing we really want to influence in the positive, in the positive way. We really want to, to have impact, real impact in our day-to-day -day 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 lives. That, that's one thing. The second thing we we are part of the ecosystem, so we are not better nor worse. We are part of the ecosystem. We have we have one specific uh, role. We have a set of skills, but we really want to make impact by partnering with the academia, global technology companies, of course, with uh, with the public sector, with uh, whoever. So er this change needs to be done through partnerships, as all of you have been have been commenting. That's the, 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 the third thing we really want, we really want, as we are global, we are big, we have a lot of people, as you, as you said, uh, working on transport and on, on mobility and so on. We really want to be a uh, scale-up enabler. So really bring, and that's a bit my role, bring from, from US, from, uh, from Arizona, from San Diego to Middle East to wherever. And, and, and we do a lot of these. We do a lot of these whenever, whenever there's, there, there is some, some, some challenge in... Uh, in Australia, we try to bring the best people from US or from Portugal or from, from whatever. And that, that's a bit what we want to do and accelerate the, 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 good, the good solutions. And I would say the last one is we really want to co-build solutions. So it's not just being a policymaker, not just being a convener. And, and we really want to build solutions. And we are building several solutions specifically on the mobility arena around mobility as a service jointly with of course partners micro mobility management solutions simulation simulation tools and so on so bringing Hi. jointly always jointly with partners bringing solutions to life of course try to pilot them in one specific city and then escalate them for other for other cities we are doing that uh, with lisbon we are doing that with many many other many other many other contexts. And that's a bit where, where we see. Uh, one, one last thing, because it's kind of recent. Based on the discussions, it's not specific on mobility, but on smart cities. We have defined that our commitment is to work, by working together with, uh, with partners and, and, and our ecosystem partners and, and technology and ecosystem, but we really want until 2030 to have an impact on more than 1 billion people. And we really think it's, 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 it's achievable by building concrete solutions and escalating them. Awesome. That's uh, just to let you know, I don't know the population of Lisbon, but you've got about 4 million here in Arizona. If you want to start here, I'm sure Lisbon will, will take <laughs> the first numbers as well. So uh, you have a willing proving ground here in Arizona. <laughs> yeah. So I believe we're just at time, but I want to throw one last question at Alex and it's a short fire one. So, Automated vehicles are obviously key to this future. 
And so where do you see in terms of jurisdictions and policy, who's going to be the leader? Who's going to be really leading the charge and getting those out at scale? Yeah, so excellent question. This is uh, playing on the winter games. Uh, we got to think of the gold, silver, bronze, maybe. Um, and, and each each country and each region is doing this a little bit differently. And I think we have to slice and dice this that you don't have one downhill ski event, you have multiple, right? And so when you think of personal mobility, there's leaders in that. Um, when you think of um, robo taxis and ride hailing, there's another piece of that, um, you know, those fleet owned. And then you also then have um, delivery as a service. So you think of uh, how uh, most of our gifts this year came in a, in a truck that came to my house, um, and those will probably go automated. And then you have the large fleet uh, semi-truck, uh, large commercial there too. And, and I think each uh, different country is leading in each of those individual <laughs> sports through there. Um, I, I'll say here in Arizona that we've done a lot of gains with our robo-taxi side of things, um, but there's some really interesting things coming out of Asia and Europe um, that I'm really interested to see what happens uh, over the next few years and decades. That's awesome. I love the the play on the winter games too. It's a perfect way to bring that in. Uh, so we're we're wrapping up here. Um, as I mentioned, this is going to be this is recorded, and we're going to be sharing this obviously with a lot of the city leaders, uh, not only in this region but around the country and around the world. So maybe final thoughts. Um, you know, one or two sentences on the future of mobility. Um, and, and maybe any pieces of advice you would give to a city manager, a CIO, someone leading the city, trying to build a better uh, future of mobility for their community. Uh, no pressure, anyone wanna go first or should I, should I just uh, throw it out there? Deputy Mayor, how about you? We'll put you on the spot. I can say some, some things about that. Well, well, first and foremost, I think there are two things. One, it's build bridges because no one will change anything alone. Here in, in, in Lisbon, we, we were the 2020 green capital and we, we used that award not to, to be, well, we were happy about the award, of course, but we use it as a compromise between the city and companies for the things that we were going to, to, do, to do together, concrete actions in the next 10 years. So build bridges, find partners that want to change the, your community and will work with you to change your community. And then the second thing, be bold. Don't be afraid to be bold. Uh, uh, take the risk, change the city. Don't be, don't be afraid of the social me media because it's very easy to have too much hate in the social media. Just do the, the proper thing and the right thing to, be, to get, create a better environment in your city. And usually people, people like it and will recognize your, your work. So don't be afraid to change. Well, just 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 fulfill the the promise of the Paris Agreement. Deliver a better world to your children, and your grandsons in 2030. Awesome! I love that. Build bridges, be bold. I'm going to use that, Miguel. Over to you. Yeah, I would say five things. Uh, start by setting your objectives. Every year, a urban ecosystem is different from 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 the other. Do a plan. Involve your stakeholders work in an ecosystem perspective and, all, and, and be uh, client-centric. And, and the last one is take care of the governance of the thing because that, that's, the, that's that on the details of governance is where everything fails because infrastructure is there, technology is there, Marana is there, the solutions are there, but we need to take care of, of, the, of the governance. So that would be my, my advice. Awesome, fantastic. Alex? Yeah, I'll just end with uh, a couple of trends that actually both Miguel's brought up, but uh, something that I think capitalizes is, is um, this idea that startups and technology companies think in days and weeks, you know, the private sector, especially large cap companies think in months and years, um, and the public sector, like the government, uh, thinks in decades. And so how do we help connect those dots between there? Um, you know, especially startups can live and die from one day to the other while we're trying to make decisions if we want to have an initial meeting through there. And so there's a way to kind of think of this from a top down approach and a bottom up. And I'll say that then speaks to uh, what Miguel, the deputy mayor was speaking about is moving these relationships and beyond, you know, public private partnerships and, and moving these from transactional to more collaborative and more community building. That's terrific. 
Well, I just want to say thank you all. This has been really probably one of the most exciting panels uh, to date over this two days. Um, and I so thank you for the attendees who joined. We'll, again, we'll be recording this and, and sending it out to everyone that wasn't able to participate. Um, but really, thank you for joining us from all around the world, from Alex, from here uh, locally in Arizona. This was an exciting panel. I don't know, Di, uh, anything to wrap us up? I am just so excited about what the next few years are going to hold in terms of mobility, especially as we think about our elderly, our young, our vulnerable population, and just hearing all of these comments and projections gives me so much hope in terms of actually protecting and enabling those people to use mobility in various different ways. I'm also excited the fact that we've even though we have to do this virtually this year, we've been able to bring in people that we otherwise wouldn't have. Um, and so this year is really about lessons from the front line. And I can't imagine a better panel to talk about that in terms of mobility challenges. So thank you all in terms of participation and your engagement today. And I think we're all, next time we meet, we'll meet in person in Lisbon. Uh, and I believe Miguel's bar has been- Yeah. Up, so. <laughs> yeah, we've already got the name. So we just need to get on a plane. Yep. Yeah, or we everyone. can do even better, right? We can we can challenge Miguel to take the drinks to the city hall, and we have a fantastic <laughs> view from the city hall. So Miguel brings takes the, the drinks. We yeah. provide the space. You so, see, public private public private partnership. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Thanks everyone. Have a great Bye -bye. day. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.